claims made in the Scripture itself. And in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the writers repeatedly claim not to be the source of the message, but to be repeating the words of God. And so what we want to do is look at some examples. And the first thing we'll look at is the Mosaic claims of inspiration. We'll look at several of these scriptures here. Uh, so if you want to turn to Exodus, the 20th chapter with me, and we'll begin there tonight. We may not read all of this, but verses 1 through 17 certainly gives us the Mosaic claims. Exodus 20th chapter, beginning with verse 1, says, And God spoke all these words, saying, So we know this from the very beginning, God spoke all these words. He said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image and any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy." And so, of course, we continue on because these are the Ten Commandments uh, up through verse 17. So now let's go to Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter, and look at Deuteronomy. <coughs> what do I mean by what, Kathy? No. All we're trying to prove here is that uh, the scriptures are inspired of God, that they are written, or they are uh, the word of God, and we're looking at the mosaic claims of inspiration right now, proving that these are all from God, not from man. And that's what we're trying to do now. Okay? Good question. Uh, by the way, I'll kind of look like I'm stiff necked tonight because I was told that when I turned my head that the mic doesn't pick me up as clear and there might be a few people that can't hear me as well and I do want everybody to be able to hear me so I appreciate that uh, comment. All right, so Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter and again we'll not read all of this but verses 1 through 22 this again is the Ten Commandments reviewed. In verse 1 it says, And Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today that you may learn them to be careful to observe them. Now notice Moses said this, okay? But now notice verse 2. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. The Lord talked with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord, for you were there... Uh, you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up to the mountain. He said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. And then we continue looking at, at the review of the Ten Commandments. The point is that Moses wrote this. Moses said, God said this, and God gave the message to the children of Israel. It wasn't man giving that message. We go back and we look at Exodus 21st chapter and verse 1. <clears throat> the detailed ordinances of the law began as God told Moses. He said, now these are the ordinances which thou shalt set before them. Uh, throughout the uh, Pentateuch, Moses repeated that which Jehovah said as he related the instruction and the admonitions given. At times, Moses did not understand the things said to God, or said by God, but he repeated the words of God to the people. In each case, though, we are reminded of the promise made to Moses when God called him to lead Israel out of bondage. Moses had protested in 
Exodus, the fourth chapter, verse 10. If you look at that, Exodus 4, verse 10. And also verse 11. But in verse 10, Moses protested. He said, O Lord, I am not eloquent. Remember, this is when God told him that he was going to be a messenger, that he was going to uh, lead the people. And Moses was making excuses, saying, I can't do this. But in verse 10, he says, I'm not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, for I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. So we have a good example of a, a man who led people that was not, probably not an eloquent speaker, but God chose him to lead the people out of bondage into the promised land. And Moses found that he couldn't make excuses because in verse 11, God responded with the promise. He said, I will be with thy mouth. In other words, I'll give you the words you need to tell the people. You're not going to make up anything because I'm telling you what you need to tell them. And teach thee what thou shalt speak. Moses had the perfect teacher here. And so we see the Mosaic inspiration here. When Moses continued to protest though, God added Aaron to work with Moses making a promise. You look at Exodus the fourth chapter and verse 15 then. Exodus 4 verse 15. The promise he said, I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. And so he said, I'll give you Aaron. Aaron will accompany you, and he will also say my words. Not his words, but my words. And so we had the Mosaic inspiration. Any thoughts or comments on the Mosaic inspiration? All right, let's look at the prophetic claims of inspiration then. The first one we'll look at is Isaiah, the first chapter, verse 2. Isaiah recognized the origin of the message from the start of his work, as is evident when he begins by saying here in Isaiah, the first chapter, in verse 2. He says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for Jehovah hath spoken. Again, man didn't make these comments. It was Jehovah that made these comments. And therefore, when we question the scriptures, we're not questioning man. We're questioning, we're questioning Jehovah. We're questioning God. The record of his call to prophetic duty makes clear whose words were to be related in the prophecies. For in Isaiah, the sixth chapter, verses 1 through 13, Isaiah, the sixth chapter, in verses 1 through uh, 13, what, we see, what we'll see here is Isaiah recognized a problem with him serving as a prophet. Uh, he had unclean lips. And God prepared Isaiah for his work uh, by the seraphim touching his mouth and lips with the live coal. So let's look at Isaiah, the sixth chapter, uh, verses 1 through 13. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with the smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. This is Isaiah saying, I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my lips have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell the people. Go and tell the people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, and lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, 
and understand with their heart and return to be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant. The houses are without a man. The land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far, far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet a tenth will be in it, and will return and be for consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak, whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. And so God is saying here to Isaiah, okay, your lips are now clean. You go and you preach and you teach what I tell you to teach. And nothing else, nothing more. And so we see here in Isaiah, the sixth chapter, indeed, that Moses was uh, given that authority, if you will, to go and preach the word. Uh, God emphasized the point to Jeremiah uh, because Jeremiah also objected. Jeremiah said, Ah, Lord Jehovah, behold, I, not, I know not how to speak, for I am a child. I am a child. And at that point, Jeremiah was told, Whatsoever I shall command thee, thou shalt speak, and nothing else. Thou shalt speak. The record then tells us that God touched the mouth of Jeremiah and, and said, I have put my words in thy mouth. And God emphasized the point saying, I watch over my word to perform it. I watch over my word to perform it. The prophet then instructed by God to speak, all that I command thee, despite the opposition, or God would dismay thee. In other words, speak all that I say and nothing else. It is clear that God is depicted as the origin of the prophet's speech then, and that God guided the very word spoken. <clears throat> the call of Ezekiel as a prophet reinforces the same point of God's control of the message recorded. And we'll not take time to look at uh, chapter 2 uh, and chapter 3, but if you looked at that, you would see Ezekiel's commission as a prophet uh, recorded here in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Ezekiel. But in Ezekiel, the second chapter, verse 2, the prophet explained the start of his work as being the point when the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me. That's when uh, Ezekiel began his work. The prophet was repeatedly told by God in Ezekiel, the second chapter, verse 7. Also, if we looked at Ezekiel, the third chapter, verse 4, and we looked at Ezekiel, the third chapter, verse 11, we'd see the same thing. God repeatedly told him, Speak my words unto them. Nothing else. And so you see the inspiration of the scriptures here because they were inspired of God and not of man. This charge was illustrated by God in his command to Ezekiel to eat the roll of the book in Ezekiel the second chapter verse 8 through Ezekiel the third chapter verse 3. Again, it is necessary for us to see the point emphasized then uh, by God with such an action. Uh, God did not give the prophet a thought upon which he was to think, but God gave him words which he was to eat. The words of God were to be put within him. And so just in the New Testament, which we'll look at a little bit later, the apostles, when they taught, they taught the word of God that was given to them by God, and it was not man's thought process. So, why did this take place? If you look at Ezekiel, the third chapter in verse 10, we see why. Ezekiel, the third chapter, verse 10. And we'll not read verse 11, but also this, I'll make a few comments about it, so you might want to read it as, as I'm commenting. But verse 10 tells us that this happened so that it could feel, fulfill the call of God. Because it says, All my words that I shall speak unto thee receive in thy heart and hear with thine ears. There was no automatic implanting of the thought to the prophet's mind. The words were given for him to speak, but he needed 
to receive them into himself in order to respond obediently. Thus God guided the words of prophecy, but the prophet had the same responsibility to apply those words as every other hearer. And I want to emphasize that because you and I have that same kind of responsibility today. To hear the word and to apply the word. And this is what the prophets did. They heard God speak, they applied what God spoke, and they taught what God spoke, not what they thought. The prophet, or, or the record of the prophet's call, also notes that Ezekiel was charged to speak all of God's words, even though the people rejected the message. And that's chapter 3, verse 11, that I suggested you might want to read yourself. Okay? So the prophet had no right to change it in order to make it more appealing to a greater number. You and I have no right to change the word of God today to make it more appealing. Well, we could do that. I've often said that if we wanted to fill this building, all we have to do is put a nice advertisement in the paper that if you'll come this Sunday, one person will be the lucky winner of a $1,000 bill. We just have to draw your number, but you have to be present to win. And that's what some religious organizations do, is they, they put in their own thought process to try to make things more pleasant for people. But God told Ezekiel, and he told the other prophets, you teach my words even though the people might reject it. And so this is exactly what they did. So the focus was not, was upon guarding the purity of God's message, whether the people accepted it or whether they rejected it. Clearly, the claim of Scripture is that the words were God's words, not the prophet's words. Any thoughts on the prophetic inspiration of the Scriptures? Yes, Luke. Um, there's an interesting consistency that moves from the Old Testament to the New Testament. When we talk about Ezekiel, how God mentions actually putting the words into him, you know, eat this scroll. And you look at Acts, you see on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came from apostles. You see it also throughout the rest of Acts, like in Acts chapter 3, where Peter and John are arrested for healing a lame man. And when Peter is giving a, a testimony to the Sanhedrin, it says the Holy Spirit moved or came in here and moved him to say these words. It, there's, instances, there's instances after instances where God, the spiritual connects to the physical for God to relay his message. Throughout, all throughout since the beginning of mankind. What's what I think separates it from false teachers, they say, or false prophets, that God gives testimony to the validity of his prophets and his apostles. In other words, the words of his prophets actually came to pass, and we can demonstrate externally that the word came to pass. And the apostles were able to testify of their validity through miracles, through signs and wonders which are recorded, and ultimately those are vindicated ultimately by the resurrection of Christ, where the body is still gone and he reigns in heaven. Well, and that's very true, and we're going to look at New Testament uh, inspiration of the Scriptures here in a second to go along with what you're saying there, um, because we had those examples. In fact, that's what we're going to look at next. Uh, we'll not look at all the Scriptures, a couple of Scriptures you mentioned that I didn't put down here, but we'll look at some, I think, that are, are pretty pertinent to support the idea that when God spoke, that settled it. Uh, and that's what he told the prophets, he said, there's going to be people that's going to reject what you teach, but you teach my word and you do, not, you do not deviate from it at all. You teach what I tell you to teach. And, and we have to accept the fact, we have to appreciate the fact that we are created by God. We are his greatest creation. And he wants what's best for us. And if he wants what's best for us, if the creator wants what's best for the creation, the creator is always going to uh, give the best guidance to the creation. And that's what he's done through his prophets and through the apostles and the disciples. And that's what we'll see in the New Testament. So, yes, Luke. Well, and that's true, and, and you heard John's sermon Sunday, and, and of course John echoed what I had said in this class earlier, that uh, there are people that are, you're, if you're going to question the validity of the scriptures, 
uh, then you'll begin with the first chapter in Genesis, and you, you actually go through the 11th chapter of Genesis, and you would suggest that all of those may not be valid, because the question is, uh, the six days of creation, were they 24-hour days, or were they uh, millions or thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of years? And the answer is found in Exodus 20th chapter, when, when God was speaking to the, the Israelites. He specifically said, you shall work six days. And then immediately following that, he said, for I created the earth and all creation in six days and rested on the seventh day. And he told the Israelites they should rest on the seventh day as well. So you have the two right there together and it makes it very clean that it ha or clear that it has to be six days. So we have to begin right there, Genesis the first chapter. If we can accept that, then we can look at Adam and Eve. We can look at uh, the uh, Noah and the flood. And, and so on. All of it is, is uh, inspired of God. It is something that God said was going to take place, and it did take place. So God said it, and that settles it. Gene? God didn't leave the apostles free to make their own decisions. That's right. The apostle John in John 14, 15, and 16, three times says that they will have a helper who will guide them into all truth. Okay, that, that was John 14, 15, and 16, you said? Okay, John 14, 26, John 15, 26, and John 16, verse 13. Uh, and all of these, God said, I will send you a helper. Exactly right. You had a comment, Jensen? Oh, okay, I thought I saw your hand. Any other comments? That's right, in Mark the 13th chapter. Um, he did tell the apostles, the disciples, that they would be arrested, that they would be uh, crucified. And we have a record of that, and we know that all of the apostles uh, did not die a nat natural death with the, ex with the exception of one apostle. And which one was that that died a natural death? John. The rest of them all suffered uh, because of their stand for God, because they taught what God told them to teach. So we look at claims of inspiration were not unique to the Old Testament then. As Luke has already suggested, they are repeatedly found in the claims of the New Testament writers as well. For instance, if you look at Acts the first chapter in verse 16, Peter and the Hebrew writer claim that the words of the Old Testament writers were actually the product of deity. And what he says was, men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before the, by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. And then you look in Acts, the third chapter, in verse 21. Whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So here we have New Testament apostles saying that everything that was said and taught in the Old Testament is true. That there was nothing that mankind themselves put in there. Look at Hebrews the third chapter and beginning in verse 7 and following. We'll read a few of those verses here. Hebrews the third chapter. Verse 7 says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they have not, not known my way. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And so we see then that here, verse 7, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear his voice. And this is the Hebrew writer saying this, exactly what God instructed him to say. And so we see the New Testament inspiration of the scriptures. In Hebrews, the 10th chapter, in verse 15, 
again, we uh, look at verse 15, but we'll look at a few verses following that. Hebrews 10 and verse 15. It says, But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after He had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds. I will write them. Then He adds, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. And so we see the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us for after he had said before. This was the Hebrew writer saying that God had said this before. Paul also in 2 Timothy chapter 1 uh, verses 8 through 14. When he was talking to a young evangelist he made this statement. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 14. Here he clearly affirmed that the message he declared was from God and not from him, and it was intended as a pattern for man to follow. For in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 14, he says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher and apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep the Holy Spirit who dwells with us. He claimed that he was as well as the uh, or that he as well as the other apostles and the prophets were directed in their revelation of God's truth by the Holy Spirit, who was the true author of his words. Look at what he said to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians the third chapter. Ephesians the third chapter, and we'll look at verses three through seven. He says, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of His power. Not man's power, but His power. And so that contention is consistent with the other Bible writers then, uh, their statements about the verbal inspiration of the prophets. Peter affirmed in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, the principle, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, And what he affirmed, he said, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And then if you go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16, Paul made the uh, claim that all Scripture, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And Peter classified Paul's writings as Scripture. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Peter said, And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul. Our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, as has written to you 
as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. But what do these writers claim to be inspired? The words revealed, or just the thought behind such? They claim that the words revealed, didn't they? Paul makes clear the claim in these words. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. And here we find then the claim is, is clear when we look at what Paul said to the church at Corinth. Verses 12 and 13 he says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So the Bible claims to be the product of divine verbal inspiration and nothing else. In other words, the thoughts and the words were not man's, but they are God's. The verbal inspiration of the scripture leads us to another aspect of inspiration which we need to consider. If God guided the very words chosen to deliver his message, his omniscience must be seen as controlling every aspect and every subject revealed in the Bible. Now I think everybody understands what the word omniscience means, but what does it mean? Huh? Omniscient means what? All-knowing. Exactly right. God is all-knowing. There's nothing left in doubt here. And so we have an all-knowing God, an omniscient God. So, <clears throat> do what, Kathy? He's everywhere. He's everywhere, yes. He's omnipresent. Uh, He's also omnipotent, all-powerful. Exactly right. So, the claim then is clear. And the verbal inspiration of the scriptures leads us to another aspect of inspiration that we need to consider then. And that is, if God guided the very words chosen to deliver his message, his all-knowing presence must be seen as controlling every aspect and every subject revealed in the Bible. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, verses that we've read uh, frequently, but we'll go back there again because this point was stressed in this very familiar passage uh, concerning inspiration. And Paul told Timothy, he said, Every scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction which is in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, furnished completely unto every good work. So there is a clear basis then for the stated conclusion that the inspired word gives us the full information and admonition needed to make us fully equipped to know and to do good. We could not be so equipped though if the Bible contained mistakes and errors in some matters it addresses. Complete furnishing in every aspect requires an inerrant source for instruction and correction. And the Bible claims to be that inerrant source regarding every matter discussed. Any comments on the New Testament inspiration? Do what, Wilma? That all scripture is God breathed. Yeah, all scripture is God breathed. Exactly right. Uh, Luke?
and he was a witness of his resurrection. These men not just, just received some miraculous inspiration, they saw it. They knew Jesus personally. In Paul's case, they, he spoke with the risen Christ. These, these men carried a testimony more powerful than anyone else to face the because they saw him physically. That's exactly right. And we have um, secular writings of men who knew the apostles, and we have secular writings of men who studied under the men who knew the apostles. So we have this train, this, this chain of evidence that supports not only that Jesus himself existed and was raised, these men that knew him were real Yes, absolutely. And you talk about Matthias, it wasn't the apostles that made the selection. It was God that chose Matthias. Uh, because God knew who he wanted to be his messengers, and he, he told them exactly what to say. So, yes, Jensen? When God sent the Holy Spirit, it was to remind them of everything that Christ taught them. That's exactly right. When God sent the Holy Spirit, it was to remind them everything that they taught them. And if you look at even the commandment that we're given... Actually, he gave the disciples, but it applies to us in Matthew, the 28th chapter, when he told the disciples to go into all the world and teach the gospel to every creature or every living uh, person. And he said, then to baptize them that believeth in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then what did he tell them to do? Huh? What did he tell them to do? Teach them to observe all things. I teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have taught you. In other words, don't teach them something else, but teach them what I've taught you. Don't stray from the message. You take the message from the messenger directly to these people exactly as you was given it. And do not, uh, do not distract or, or uh, move away from it. All right, so um, what we want to look at then, uh, now then, is, uh, i get it down here. Claims of plenary inspiration. Claims of plenary insp inspiration. What does the word plenary mean? I already put it up there, didn't I? Well, you know, I was trying to help you out. Besides the first bell rang, I wanted to move along with this slide, this thought process, okay? But yeah, it means full, complete, or absolute. And though the word is not found in the Bible... The concept surely is. If you turn to Psalms 119, and let me put it up there, 119 verse 128. We'll look at these uh, Psalms here, these scriptures. Psalm 119 verse 28, or 128, I'm sorry. The psalmist said here, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. Now, David accepted the fact that what God said was exactly the truth, that there was no reason to question it. That leaves room for no mistake, if you think about it. In any realm, the Bible claim is clear. And you and I, as Christians, should accept what God says without questioning the Creator. It was also re repeated in Psalms uh, 19, verses 7 through 9, if you'll turn over there. King David made this statement in Psalm 19, verses 7 through 9. He said, The law of Jehovah is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of Jehovah is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of Jehovah are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Jehovah is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Jehovah is clean, enduring forever. The ordinance of Jehovah are true and righteous altogether. And so indeed, uh, we see what David had to say about the word of God. And you think about it, God's control and guidance of every word of his revelation explains its accuracy and prophecies made hundreds of years, hundreds of years before their fulfillment. You go to the Old Testament and Isaiah and some of the other uh, books, and you see the prophecy of Jesus Christ made hundreds of years before it all took place. You saw the prophecy of John the Baptist hundreds of years before John the Baptist uh, came upon the first the face of the earth. You saw the crucifixion or the the uh, 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 betrayal of Judas 
That was prophesied hundreds of years before it took place. And it took place because the scriptures are accurate. Uh, even in the areas where the human spokesman did not comprehend the things that he was saying, God guided the accuracy and truthfulness of the message by means of inspiration. Go to 1 uh, Peter chapter 1, if you will, and let's look at verses 10 through 12. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. Peter says, Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what? Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. In verse 12, To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. In that way, the inerrancy of the scriptures were ensured. Any comments? Say again, Luke. This passage we talk about the, the, the spirit that we Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, he was revealing his message to them even before he came to this world. So, all right. Well, our time got away from us, so we'll stop here and we'll uh, continue on. Well, next Wednesday night, I uh, understand, is singing. So we'll have singing next Wednesday night. We'll continue with this the following Wednesday night.